Israel cannot do what it does without the United States. And that means that Biden and Harris and Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and Jeffries and Schumer and Pelosi and all of the top Democrats are responsible for this. Uh, at the same time, what we know very clearly and what maybe the rest of the United States doesn't know is that Israel is losing. Israel has not been able to accomplish what they want to accomplish in Gaza. They cannot defeat the unified Palestinian resistance. Welcome to Fight Back Radio, a production of fightbacknews.org, taking you to the heart of the people's struggle. And today uh, we have two guests for you that I think uh, will give a special uh, look at what's going on currently in the United States and how political people are moving to try to handle these kinds of things. Um, today we have uh, Hatem Abudeya, who is uh, the, um, the national chair of the United States Palestinian Community Network, and uh, Frank Chapman, who's the executive director of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, and is also a member of the Central Committee of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. So I'm going to start out today with, uh, with Hatham um, and say, you know, the, for the last year, um, the issue of Palestine has dominated the news. And, uh, and for, in fact, for the last 75 years, uh, the people of Palestine have been suffering, uh, you know, land grabs and, you know, all kinds of oppression and, uh, and death and imprisonment. And, uh, um, but I want to, you know, say, you know, uh, I want to ask you, Hatham, uh, in the most recent period and, and, it's, and over the last year, what has been going on? And as a Palestinian American, uh, how, do you, how do you sum that up? How do you view our current situation? So first of all, thanks for having me on again. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this show specifically, and of course to be sharing the uh, um, the 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 show with Frank Chapman, who is a you know a legend in the Black Liberation Movement and a a mentor and and very close friend of mine. Um, I'm honored to be doing this together with him. Um, you know. There's nobody in this country that knows more about what's happening in Palestine um, than the folks who are, you know, represented on this show today. Like, you know, the Palestinians in USPCN, my organization, and um, all of the different national and local organizations around the country. The National Alliance Against Racist Political Repression has been with us, standing with us side by side, shoulder to shoulder for... Um, not only the 11 months that we've been trying to fight to stop this genocide, but for decades and decades. Um, and Frank will talk about that relationship a little bit later. But, um, you know, we're in the thick of it right now. We're the ones who are the, doing the organizing. Um, it's the National Alliance and the Chicago Alliance here in this city and the National Alliance and other cities that are working closely with all the Palestinians in their different cities to try to stop this genocide. And so... Where we are right now um, is that 40,000 Palestinians have been killed. Um, there's probably a lot more. Uh, a very well-respected medical journal called The Lancet talks about not only the, those that are killed directly in war, and, and we think that's 40,000. There could be 10 or 20,000 more that are under the rubble still in Gaza. But The Lancet says that there could be 186,000 Palestinians who have been killed in Gaza um, as direct or indirect um, victims of, of the genocide, meaning all of the people who are dying from disease, um, you know, from starvation, uh, all of those things that are the direct result of the genocide, the Lancet counted, and they came up with 186,000. It reminds me of the days of the Iraq War, when we talked about how many Iraqis were being killed by the United States occupation and invasion, at the same time, we knew that sanctions, you know, were killing hundreds of thousands more. And I think that's the situation that we're looking at in Gaza right now. Um, and the reason it's happening is because the United States is allowing it to happen. Um, the important element here is that the U.S. supports Israel unequivocally, diplomatically, politically, militarily, financially, um, on all of those different levels. 
And if the United States did not want this to happen, if the United States wanted to stop it, it doesn't matter how much of a, um, you know, a, a malcontent that Netanyahu is, the prime minister of Israel. Um, it doesn't matter how much, how strong the Israel lobby is in the United States, for example, because they are strong. Um, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the relationship between U.S. empire and Israel. U.S. imperialism needs Israel as its watchdog in the Arab world, in the Middle East, the state that has been propped up, has become the strongest military in the Middle East uh, because of U.S. support and U.S. arms sales and U.S. money um, to make sure that all of the U.S. interests align, make sure all of the U.S. interests are protected. Israel does that. So that is the relationship. And so Israel cannot do what it does without the United States. And that means that Biden and Harris and Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and Jeffries and Schumer and Pelosi and all of the top Democrats are responsible for this. Uh, at the same time, what we know very clearly and what maybe the rest of the United States doesn't know is that Israel is losing. Israel has not been able to accomplish what they want to accomplish in Gaza. They cannot defeat the unified Palestinian resistance. And I say, I call it the unified Palestinian resistance because the mainstream press in this country wants to describe this conflict as Israel versus Hamas. You know, still the New York Times on every headline says the Israel-Hamas war. And because the New York Times says it, every other mainstream press outlet in the entire country, maybe the world says it. And we reject that. Not because um, Hamas is not a part of the resistance. Of course they are. And right now they are the strongest part of the Gaza resistance. But that resistance includes all of the Palestinian political organizations and all of the military um, organizations in Gaza, not just Hamas. Palestinian Islamic Jihad and, and Fatah and the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, all of those, plus a bunch of other smaller Palestinian organizations are fighting together to defend their land, defend their people against this brutal settler, colonialist, racist state. And so folks who are watching this, who are listening to this, should really log on to Resistance News Network on Telegram. You get up-to-the-minute updates from the resistance itself. Very, very powerful and very important because we get so, much, so many lies from the U.S. government. We have so many lies from the Israeli government. We get so many lies from the New York Times and the Washington Post of the world. And you can hear from the resistance forces, the political leadership of the resistance forces directly on Telegram. And they put out uh, communiques on a, on a daily basis. Also, I want to pitch uh, a show of my friends at Electronic Intifada. I was on last week. Um, they have an incredible, incredible segment about the resistance every week as well. Um, and I think it's important for people to watch that so they understand what's happening here. Uh, Israel is losing militarily in Gaza. They can't accomplish what they want to accomplish, which is to defeat the resistance. And, um, and that means that, uh, you know, that's why Netanyahu is digging in his heels because he recognizes that if he accepts a deal with the Palestinians, um, then he's out on his ass almost immediately. He's no longer going to be the prime minister. So he is putting the lives of all of these tens of thousands of Palestinians, um, you know, on the line on a daily basis, threatening them with bombing and missiles and killing for hit for the political purposes of him staying in power, um, regardless of what he says to the world, which are lies after lies. And the, 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 the last thing I'll say about it for now is that um, this issue of ceasefire 
is not even the language that we should be using any longer. Ceasefire was was so November 2023, right? When Cori Bush from Missouri, the black congresswoman, put out a resolution and only you know, maybe 18 other congresspeople signed on to it. Right now, we say, have to say, stop the genocide. Right now, how do you stop the genocide? Is you stop U.S. aid to Israel and you implement an arms embargo so they can no longer use U.S. weapons to perpetrate this genocide. And if we stop them from using U.S. weapons, then they're not going to be able to continue to do it. So that's what our responsibility is in the United States. We're fighting to end the genocide, stop the genocide, end U.S. aid to Israel, implement an arms embargo. And that's what the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, even millions of people in the streets um, have been doing over for the last year. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, Hatham. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, tell our Fight Back Radio listeners, uh, you know, so first, uh, you know, Hatham uh, made a, a reference to, he's, he's a return guest to Fight Back Radio. And the first time he was on, and I would say some other guests too, we've, we've, we've talked about Palestine. I would encourage our listeners to go back to previous episodes and listen to what Hatham and others have had to say. Also, um, and including a, a uh, Marine Claire Murphy, who was uh, from the Electronic Intifada um, that you referred to. We'll put in our show notes uh, the uh, resistance uh, uh, link as well as uh, the Electronic Intifada so people can go there and uh, find the, find, easily find those things. Um, I wanted to ask you quickly, Hatham, a follow-up question here, though. Uh, there's been a lot of, t- you know, the, uh, these negotiations that have been going on that they keep talking about uh, for, for ceasefire. And you, you, you referenced them a little bit here, but there, there's talk about the, um, the I, I might be saying it wrong here, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia uh, line between uh, Egypt and, uh, and Gaza. And, uh, you know, there's, there's always, it seems to be some problem when, you know, they're, they're close to an agreement. In fact, uh, um, the resistance actually did agree to uh, something that Biden announced and then uh, Israel said, oh, well, no, that we didn't really agree. It wasn't our, really our agreement, as uh, Biden had said. Can you talk a little bit about how, where these negotiations are at now and um, uh, how you see them as, a, a, as an activist in the community here? Yeah, so I think this is really important, and I, and I, can, I can wrap this up in a, in, a, in, a, in a short period here so we can get to, to Frank. But, um, you know... This is part of what we did when we actually had to scold the media during the DNC, because when we were doing our press conferences, one of the questions from one of the national media was um, that the president had announced at that time uh, that Israel had agreed to a to a ceasefire and uh, and that he was he was calling on the resistance to agree to it. And I, you know, I went off on them and I said, you all continuously parrot what Biden says and what Netanyahu says and what the Israeli military and and politicians say without understanding at all exactly what's going on. And essentially what was going on is that the resistance had always been negotiating in good faith. On July 2nd, as you said, they had accepted a ceasefire arrangement with the Israelis um, and Netanyahu continued to just move the goalposts, as we say. Um, And then he refuses a permanent ceasefire, which is the number one thing that the Palestinians are are calling for. He refuses a complete withdrawal from from Gaza, and that's the Philadelphia corridor that is near the Rafah crossing in the border between Egypt and, and Gaza. Um, and he insists on, uh, new conditions all the time regarding the exchange of the Israeli detainees for the Palestinian political prisoners. So on July 2nd, we said, yes, we're ready to accept this arrangement that was announced by Biden. And that was part of a UN security council resolution as well. Security council resolutions are binding and the Israelis are the ones who said no. And the Israelis continuously move the goalposts, refusing these basic terms of ending the occupation fully, leaving the Rafah crossing and the Philadelphia corridor fully. Um, and if they're not going to do that, then, then you know the Israelis are lying by claiming that they're doing this in good faith. And, and the U.S. actually is acknowledging 
that, you know, that the Israelis are the ones who are keeping this arrangement from happening. Okay. Well, I want to move to, to Frank Chapman here now, uh, who, as I said, is uh, the uh, executive director of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And Frank, you know, you, you have a long, you and your organization have a long-standing relationship with uh, USPCN and the, and the Palestinian National Movement, um, uh, going back to uh, um, the days of uh, having, a, a, you know, you know, Rasmia O'Day and, and, and others, you know, fighting for people's uh, freedom um, that were, you know, people that were repressed here in the United States, Palestinians. But uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you know your, your reaction to some of what uh, uh, Hatham just said? And, um, uh, you know, as a leader of the Black Liberation Movement, um, you know, let me ask, why do you, why do you care about Palestine? And there's a whole uh, you know, grouping of people that would say you should focus on your thing, and uh, you know that's tragic, but we need to move on. So, how, how would you answer that kind of thing? Well, I think uh, uh, our movement, the Black Liberation Movement, answered this a long time ago. I think it was answered during the Vietnam War. Dr. King answered it when he gave his speech at the Riverside Church, and he answered it in a couple of ways. One way was to say that he talked about how the war was robbing the American people, in particular the black people, of resources and whatnot that were needed to remedy the problem that we have here. Uh, billions and billions of dollars was going into the war. Uh, billions and billions of dollars was promised to go into ending discrimination, supporting affirmative action, enforcing the Voting Rights Act, and, and so forth and so on. And though, and that promise was never kept by LBJ. The Great Society promises were never kept. And, and, and King pointed out that the primary reason was the Vietnam War. So he, ma he made that connection. He made the connection between uh, uh, war and, 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 our, and our democratic struggles here in this country for a better life and, and for black liberation. Uh, and I think that's still true today. In fact, I think it's even more true because uh, look, at, look at how much money the Biden administration has continually poured into Israel. You know, it's way north of $300 billion now. You know, uh, just, just on the eve of the convention, they gave another $60 billion. So, you know, the, 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 the amount of money is astronomical. And, and he did this at a time when he was talking about Build Back, build back America. Well, what happened to that? You know, the, 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 ain't, nothing, ain't nothing happening with it, you know. What happened with the George Floyd bill? Nothing, nothing's happening with it, you know. Uh, what's happening with all the other domestic problems that we have here that need uh, money and political attention in order to get, uh, to get something done? Nothing. Immigration rights, nothing. Women's rights, nothing. LGBTQ, nothing, you know. Uh, so this war is hurting everybody, you know, and it needs to stop. Uh, the Black Liberation Movement has a special interest in, 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 in stopping this war, and that, and that is because the same people, the same forces, the same political forces, and I ain't talking about Democratic and Republican. I'm talking about the same political forces in the United States, I'm talking about the, the, monopoly, the monopolies, the capitalist bosses. They are the ones who are benefiting here, and they're benefiting at our expense. So the same people that are over there killing, uh, financing the killing and the murder of Palestinian children, one Palestinian child every, every 18 minutes dies, are the same people that are responsible for murdering and killing our people here in the United States. The same people, you know. and. We're we're uh, we're socially intelligent enough to recognize that, yeah. and so based on that, you know, we uh, I, we we stand with Palestine one thousand percent. I agree with I agree with Hatem. It's not just about the ceasefire. It's about in all support, military and diplomatic and financial, in all support, you know, to Israel, and the Palestinian Liberation Movement handled the rest for itself, you know. Uh, the United States needs to get out of there, and they need to get out of there now. And the Black Liberation Movement, the progressive, the the the, the, the progressive core, 
the radical core of the black liberation movement of this country, which goes all the way back to 1967, when the Student Unvined Coordinating Committee came out in support of the Palestinians, has always supported the Palestinian liberation movement, and we do right now. So, uh, yeah, thank let you. Me, for, let me jump in for a second. Sure, here. I just ahead. want to say one thing on as a piggyback to what Frank said, um, and I mentioned it at the beginning how, like, you know, we we believe very strongly that our closest allies in this country coming are coming from the Black Liberation Movement, um, and and one of the examples of how uh, how apprehensive the enemy is of that unity and that solidarity um, was when the movement for black lives came out with a platform a few years back mm -hmm. and called and called um, Israel an apartheid state and, and mentioned um, that it was an occupier and a colonizer uh, and the, the Zionist organizations in this country lost it the anti-defamation league the jewish united fund the jewish federation jewish federation of metropolitan chicago and other metropolitan areas uh they attacked the movement for black lives and the movement for black lives was at that time you know i'm not sure if it's still considered like the the umbrella of all of the black liberation uh work happening in this country and it was representative of you know, the black struggle specifically around, of course, police crimes and police killings started with the, the Michael Brown killing and, and Trayvon Martin and, and then, you know, the, the, the Chicagoans we know so well, Laquan McDonald and, and others. Um, and they, they went wild. They went crazy attacking the black liberation movement in this country. It wasn't the first time. Right. And it wasn't the first time. Absolutely. Uh, they closed down Student Unviolent Coordinating Committee in 1967 during the 67 war for the same reason, because they supported the Palestinian Liberation Movement. They fired Andy Young, who was the first progressive, uh, first representative uh, of, of the Civil Rights Movement to be given the ambassadorship in the United Nations. They fired him over the course of Palestine. That, that, was, that was back in the 60s, you know. So now, this has been, this has been going on for a long, long time, you know. And, 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 and it's continuing to go on right now. The, the, the solidarity between the Palestinian movement and the black liberation movement is not new. You know, we, we, we've stood together historically. And the reason for that is because, as I was saying earlier, we share a common oppressor. We share, and we understand that. Now, uh, I can't speak for those who don't understand it, but I'm speaking for those who do. But the reason they're so fearful of it is because of how significant the black liberation movement is in this country. That's the part of it that people need to understand. We're, you know, the Palestinians are doing great work right now. I, right. I am very proud of our organizing in all of our cities around the United States since October and even way before that. We have solidified ourselves as a, as a legitimate community that, you know, that organizes in this country and is, is starting to make things happen. The reason we're under attack, the reason why we're oppressed all the time is because we're doing effective, impactful work. Mm -hmm. But it terrifies the Zionists and the U.S. government and the enemy, essentially, that the strongest, most important liberation organization in this country, uh, liberation movement, I'm sorry, in this country, the black liberation movement is with us unequivocally. That is terrifying to them. Frank, I want to go back to you here. Um, and we've... Uh uh, I want to look at you know all the things that that Hatham said and and and, and you about this unit. It's, it's just so impressive. But we're we're in a particular moment right now. There's a, elections for uh, president of the United States coming up, and a whole slew of other national offices as well. And uh, uh, you know, in the introduction, I mentioned you're on the Central Committee of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Um, in light of a uh, uh, you know, what's going on in Palestine, but also all the other issues in, in the country. Um, you know, how should we be approaching uh, this election and how do you see the forces involved um, in this election um, that's coming up and how should we be looking at it? Well, um, I did, I did uh, some, some real serious thinking on this and I'd like to point out a couple of things. 
Uh, some people see uh, the present moment like this, that the, 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 the main danger we face right now, they're not saying is, 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 is the genocidal war in Gaza. They're saying the main danger we face right now is Donald Trump. And they're saying that's because he will take our country back to the 19th century, so they used to they used to call it the fascist threat, but now 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 they're, they're, they're kind of modifying that, and they're saying the Trump threat, and so you have the uh, the the, so, the socialist wing of the Democratic Party, DSOC, and you have uh, uh, other uh, quote unquote so called left forces, who are saying that we need to have the broadest possible united front, and in, in, I'm talking about the elections. We have the broadest possible united front to defeat Donald Trump in these elections, and 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 and, and they're not they're not making Gaza pivotal in this anyway. They're saying that the number one thing is to defeat Donald Trump. That's it, because he represents a grave danger to democracy and to our people in this country, you know. And so we should uh, we should be considering that first and foremost. Now these same people say that uh, we represent the left, but we're not leading the Democratic Party. The centrists under the leadership of Kamala Harris are leading the Democratic Party. And where they stand is they are, there's no light between them and Biden when it comes to Gaza. So that's, that's, yes. that's, 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 that's the situation. And so what's our position with regard to that situation? Our position is that we have to oppose this war. We have to make it the pivotal concern because it is the pivotal concern, not only of world peace, but it's the pivotal concern of our people here in the United States, you know, and that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, we can't say one or the other based on the war. They, they both got the same position. So it's like somebody said, well, what about the lesser evil? Well, show me the lesser evil. Show, show, show me where they're less evil. Show, show, what, what's the lesser evil on the border? Well, well, the immigration rights people will tell you they can't find it. They can't find the lesser evil. What's the lesser evil when it comes to the uh, George Floyd bill? The Democrats ain't done, ain't done shit on that. They've done nothing on that. Where's the lesser evil when it comes to the indigenous people drilling for oil and whatnot and mining on the, on, on, in, in their sovereign territories that's, that's protected by treaties? They, they, there's no lesser evil there. So while, while you're talking about look out for evil coming at us, you know, you're also talking about allowing people to get their seats of power again we haven't done a damn thing in terms of changing any policy on all of these questions that I just raised. They've done nothing. So, so you're being frightened by a boogeyman. You're being frightened into voting for the same shit. Whether you're talking about Trump or whether you're talking about Biden. They are both warmongers. One's an international war criminal. I mean, according to the international court, you know. And one has been convicted of 34 felonies. So I don't see no lesser of two evils. There's got to be a fundamental change in policy, period. And that's why I think it was so, the DNC was so significant. Um, you know, the USPCN, the National Alliance, were two of the main leading organizations that led the DNC. Uh, protests and you know we had 39,000 people out there on three of the four days of the pro uh, of the of the convention um, and we had all of these issues represented indigenous rights immigrant rights women's and reproductive rights black liberation the movement to stop police crimes the movement for police accountability all of them said that the Democratic Party has been taking them for granted for decades and decades. 
On top of that, they all said in unity that the number one issue, the centrality of the movement right now in the United States is the movement to stop the genocide. That's why we were comparing it to the Vietnam War. Yes, there are no U.S. boots on the ground in Palestine except for the CIA and the advisors. Um, but make no mistake, it is a U.S. war. Israel would not be able to prosecute that genocide without the United States. That's right. So all of these forces, black liberation, who are saying, of course the black community has been taken for granted uh, by the the Democrats in this country for decades. Immigrant rights, talking about the militarization of the border. The Obama administration is the one that has detained and deported more undocumented immigrants than any other administration, Democrat. Um, the indigenous rights struggles that, that Frank is describing, women's and reproductive rights struggles. Like, even when we used to make the argument that said, of course, there's a lesser of two evils on domestic policies, even if there might not be on the foreign policy. Well, now we've got some examples of the fact that even the domestic policies, the Democrats aren't very much That's aren't right. much better on. So, so at this point, the, if the overriding issue is is the genocide, and both Biden and Harris and everybody else in the top leadership of the Democratic Party is saying that they are going to continue to support Israel, then how could anybody in good conscience actually vote for that party right now? That's the party that is in power. That's the reason why we protested the DNC. People asked us, well, what about Trump and what about the RNC? Well, we were there too. But the reason why the DNC protests were so much bigger, almost 40,000 people that we had in the streets that week, is because the Democrats are the ones that are in power. And I just want to read a couple quotes really quickly from Harris in her acceptance speech on Thursday night of the DNC. I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself. But more importantly, she said, I will always ensure that Israel has the ability to defend itself. So what does that tell you? Clearly, that second clause is saying that means we will never stop giving them the weapons. No change that in they policy. Need, right? No change in policy. Despite, despite, despite the fact that over 60% of the Democrats do not support this war, in spite of the fact that the majority of the American people do not support this war. So on behalf of their imperialist interests, on behalf of the banks and the monopolies, because that, 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 that $300 billion plus that they give to Israel, see, they don't actually give Israel the weapons per se or the planes per se, they give them the money. They take that money and they buy those planes and they buy those weapons from U.S. corporations. So it's like a racket. They give Israel the money, they buy, they, 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 they buy the guns from the corporations. So this is, so this is what's really going on. This, this has nothing to do with serving the interests of the people in the, of this country. And the people of this country are waking up to that. But it's our job and it's our responsibility as organizers and agitators and people who want to see real change, it's our responsibility to wake them up too. It's our responsibility to agitate for real change. We're not talking about some ca cosmetic bull crap. You know, this war needs to stop. This war needs to stop. There can be no talk of social progress in this moment with this war still going on. So I, I want to push back a little bit here. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I was at the, the marches on both the Democratic and the Republican conventions as well. And I think there's no question that the Democratic Party has been, you know, impotent in trying to uh, execute any kind of real change for working people. Um, but there, there's differences between the two, maybe not on foreign policy, maybe not on the question of the war um, in Palestine. But, um, I mean, if you, if you talk to people that are in organized labor, for example, they remember when Donald Trump was president of the United States and he, he put people into positions of power in the uh, National Labor Relations Board and other places that were, were there specifically to weaken and dismantle uh, uh, labor unions. And so you have labor union leaders that are, um, you know, are saying, look, we're, we're supporting uh, Kamala Harris 
because uh, you know, even if she's not great, she won't try to get rid of us completely. And I, I think also you're seeing, uh, you know, there was, you know, this is why, you know, Bi- since Biden stepped aside, I think Kamala Harris is actually more conservative than uh, than Biden was. But um, but but she, there's no denying that a, a real energy was infused into the the Democratic Party into no and, and you know money and, and resources and and people you know legitimately proud of uh, having a black woman uh, be uh, um, you know potentially be pr- president of the United States and and you know the Democrats have been you know weak at pushing back. Uh, you know, the Republicans, though, uh, are the ones that are responsible for the current Supreme Court and issues of reproductive justice and things like that. So when, when, when people uh, uh, that are supporting, you know, Harris, they'll come to me and, and probably to you guys, too, and say, look, we shouldn't criticize her. We shouldn't be talking about Palestine or Gaza because this hurts her chance. You know, she's the lesser of two imperialists. We and, disagree. And, yeah. So, well, well, tell us how do you how do you deal with that? We, we disagree because we should be criticizing, and 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 we disagree because uh, we are we are opposed to the status quo. Uh, we disagree because we are not about pushing the politician. We're about pushing the issues, and so it fundamentally comes down to this. Where does she stand on the issues? What, what does she stand on the issue of taxing the rich? She's worse than Biden. Yeah. You know, what, 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 what does she stand on the, you know, we could just go down. But I don't want to get into an attack yeah. on, on, on Kamala Harris because uh, that's not what this is about. You know, it's about policies. And, 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 and we're talking about policies that, Kamala Harris supports, like what Hatem just read off. They don't call her, a, 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 a kill, you know, killer Kamala for nothing. You know, we're talking about genocidal policies, the, the, the murdering of the Palestinian people on a daily basis, minute by minute, hour by hour, that she has supported, unflinchingly supported. That's what we're talking about. Now, you can't throw no dirt in our eyes and blind us to those facts by saying that she's a black woman and she deserves to be president of the United States. Of course she does, if, 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 if people want to vote her in. But we don't just vote for people to be presidents regardless of what their policies are. There's a political struggle going on here, and this political struggle is demanding some justice from the U.S. government when it comes to Palestine. And we're not getting that. And she's talking about taking, taking the helm of that government. And we're, so we're demanding of her to do it. Stop the war. Stop the war. Period. I, I want to pivot a little bit to, uh, and I want to go to you, Hatham, here. Um, in the, the spring of 2024, um, this, the, the campuses in the United States um, were on fire. You know, there was these encampments and, uh, um, uh, and, and, you know, things, you know, maybe cooled off a little bit over the summer. But um, I want to... Uh, uh, you know, we're, school start. You know, the colleges are going back to school again, and uh, um, I know that the the Arab students uh, played a leadership role on many of the campuses across the United States. But even uh, uh, places where there was low numbers of Arab students, you know, people stood up. Students of of every nationality and background stood up against the genocide. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that, and uh, what we're you know what we maybe will be seeing this fall. Yeah, so I'm I'm really I'm really glad again to be doing this with with Frank. I think it, you know the not not only the decades of experience that he's had as an organizer dealing with all of these questions, um, very similar questions for many many years, um, but you know being so unabashed and and unequivocal in in the, in the perspectives as well, you know, um, of course you know, an 82 year old black man who supports his, his community so, so strongly. And, and is such an incredible, you know, community organizer to this day, to this day, Frank Chapman still sits at a table on a, on a, on a, on a corner in front of storefronts on the South side of Chicago to distribute literature and to talk to people in the streets about police crimes about racism, 
about you know uh, what we need to do as a community um, to to change those policies. Um, and you know it's it's an, just an incredible example to the rest of us, all all of us who talk about being a little bit tired these days, being a little bit burned out these days. Don't tell me about being tired and burnt out when you when you look at Frank Chapman and the fact that he's still doing this grassroots community based organ, organizing six decades later, you know. Um, and so when when you hear him be forceful about his positions, um, even when he's talking about somebody from his own community who, you know, he cannot support because of her policies, because she is not saying anything different than what Joe Biden said. She's not saying anything different than what Anthony Blinken is saying. She's actually not saying anything different than what Netanyahu is saying, <laughs> in fact. And so um, that's important for us to hear uh, when, it, when it comes from a, a Frank Chapman. Um, I will say, too, I want to shout out two very, very important organizations as well that led a lot of the work that you're talking about on the campuses. The Students for Justice in Palestine, of course. They got dozens and dozens of chapters around the country. Mm -hmm. And the Students for a Democratic Society, which also have has dozens and dozens of chapters around the country. Um, they're not the only two student organizations, of course. Black student unions, Chicano student unions, um, you know, LGBTQ student organizations, uh, a lot of different forces on those campuses participated. And we saw it. You know, we all visited the Alliance people and USPCN and every all the other, like, you know, social justice forces in Chicago visited the Northwestern encampment when it first came up. It was the first one in, in the Chicago area. Then we went to University of Chicago. We went to DePaul, um, you know, and, and we, we saw it. You know, we saw how diverse it was. We saw how there were all different nationalities, ethnicities, religions, people with no religions, um, you know, all these different forces that were out there. And not only was it important that those students rose up the way they did and built those encampments and made demands of their campuses, right? They said, our campus is complicit in the genocide because we invest all these millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars in, in, in Israel. And we need to stop that investment and we need to divest instead. That was the demand. Absolutely. Disclose, divest, we will not stop, we will not rest. Disclose the relationship that you have with Israel, the financial relationship you have with Israel, yes. and then divest from Israel because of this genocide that has killed 40,000, probably many, many more. Um, so SJP, SDS, shout them out for being in the leadership of that. But I wanna say one other thing about it that I think is really, really important. New York University already, in the beginning of the fall, changed its student conduct policy to say that Zionism and Zionist is a protected class. They're trying to say that if you attack Zionists and Zionism, it's the same as if you're attacking Islam or Judaism or somebody for being uh, from the LGBTQIA plus community or anybody who identifies with, um, with, a, with a class that has been historically discriminated against. Mm -hmm. New York University established this policy specifically to criminalize Palestinian students and their supporters on that campus who have been doing such an incredible job of organizing to challenge and attack that racist, settler colonialist, apartheid system of Zionism. And, and now it's a protected class. That proves not only what we said earlier, how important the black liberation movement is in this country yes. and its relationship to Palestine, but how important the student movement is and how terrified they are of the fall and a, and a rise in encampments again. Another example that I think is super, super important for four hours, four hours at UCLA, Zionist protesters against the encampment attacked those students. 
not just with slogans and with chants, mm. with stones and with sticks and with chemical agents, attack those students at UCLA for four hours before the police did anything, before the police even tried to push them away from those Palestinian students and their supporters. Four hours, right? We all, we're always falling all over ourselves in this country, especially in Congress, to talk about free speech. And everybody has the right to free speech and let the students, uh, let, the, let people say what they want to say, yes. especially now because <clears throat> with the ultra right and the racism that gets spewed all day, every day, and, and even Congress tries to defend it, right? But when the Palestinian students and their supporters come out and say, we're rising up mm. in this new student uprising um, and escalation to stop the genocide, it was the Congress, it was Congress people. It was the mayor of New York, Eric Adams. It was the guy that was gonna be the, um, the, the, the guy that was, that Kamala Harris was gonna choose as her vice president, the Pennsylvania governor. Um, it was those types that were saying, that were attacking the students, calling them, the, the Pennsylvania governor, the Zionist dude call, said that it was like the KKK was in my state when he was talking about the Palestinian students. But none of them said anything about those Zionists for four hours who had attacked the students at UCLA. That That's was right. one of the most upsetting, one of the most enraging things I ever experienced in 25 years of organizing those four hours where I was watching in real time these young people getting attacked by the pig Zionists. And they are pigs. The Zionists in this country and, and in Israel and everywhere else, they're the most racist, they're the most rabid racist, they're, they're settler colonialists, they know that they're coming from Europe, they know that they're white settlers who are taking over, uh, try, you know, stealing the, the land of indigenous people, and they're proud of it. They're proud of it. They, in, yeah. in, in Palestine, they march and they say death to Arabs publicly, but how many of the 535 Congress people and senators in this country say, oh my goodness, that's... That's like apartheid South Africa. How could we say that this, this, this apartheid system, this Zionist system has the right to exist? That doesn't happen. Instead, they support the folks who are attacking the students. That's what we're up against here. And that's yes. why these students need our unequivocal support. And they're going to get it. We're ready. The Alliance is, USPCN is, SJP, SAS. All of us are ready when it, when it comes down to these kids in Chicago, when they put up those encampments again, we're ready to be out there and supporting them. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think um, they've been an inspiration to people across the country. I know in, in, within the labor movement, you saw um, the United Auto Workers have come out uh, against uh, military aid uh, to Israel. They were one of the first uh, big unions to do that. And um, one of the reasons uh, is because they represent people, uh, 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 education workers in California. And, uh, and they, these education workers saw some of this, what was going on. And there was, you know, there was strikes and speech and et cetera. And so Sean Fain, the, the leader of, of the auto workers nationally, uh, came out and have said this. Um, and since then, you've seen, you know, besides you know, uh, people like the United Electrical Workers, um, who've always been on the progressive side. You've seen the Service Employees International Union has come out against military aid uh, to Israel. And we've seen uh, uh, more recently, I think, uh, from the building trades, the Painters Union, the International Union of Painters and uh, Allied Trades, uh, Jimmy Williams, their international president, just made a very strong statement saying that they uh, um, would not give a uh, uh, they would not not support any uh, aid to or any uh, uh, military aid to Israel. So the, the students have, have been in the forefront of uh, of moving some of this along. And so I, I want to turn to you, Frank. I know uh, uh, you know you were involved. I heard Hatham talking about the anti-apartheid movement, but I know you were in, involved in that uh, mm -hmm. uh, when it was at its peak, and, and students played an important role in that as well. If you if you want to comment on that. Yeah, uh, the students played a very important role in getting uh, divestments from uh, South African banks, from South Africa, f f banks that did business with South Africa, uh, the unions that had pension funds in those banks uh, withdrew those pension funds out of those banks. Uh, uh, there was, divest there was a, a, a divestiture movement, which the students played a very powerful role in because their universities were invested. And they, they got the universities to divest. I think the same thing, the same motion is, is, is happening and is going to happen even further 
with regard to, to uh, Israel. Uh, and I, 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 I just want to make one point that uh, Hatem touched on and I think is very, very important. Uh, let's, let's get one thing clear. The United States government was not opposed to apartheid in South Africa. That's right. Let's, let's, let's be clear about that. Uh, we had to fight hard as hell to get this government to take a stand. And even after they took a stand, and even after uh, uh, the ANC, you know, and Mkoto we had had, 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 had had assumed the seat of power in South Africa, and, and Nelson Mandela came over to visit the country, and everybody was congratulating him on his successes and whatnot. Did you know at the time that he was shaking hands with Clinton that he was on the terrorist list of the United States? They, they never took him off the terrorist list, you know. And so that shows you two things. That shows you, one, where the U.S. government stands on this question, and two, the power of the movement, the power of the movement. Because like what we did in terms of getting this government to, to, to turn around its policy with regard to apartheid in South Africa to stop supporting the South African regime, you know, we can do the same thing with regard to Israel. You know, we, we, can, we can build a movement that powerful. We are building a movement that powerful. You know, uh, eventually we're going to be the victors in this, in this struggle, you know. Yeah, I, I think, uh, it, 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 you know, Frank always inspires me all the time. And I think um, I've said before, uh, and I remember I said this to UCLA uh, at the Students for Justice and in Palestine conference um, a few years back, I said to all these 500 students or whatever, uh, I talked about Rasmia's campaign. Uh, my colleague who a few years ago was deported from the United States. Mm. She was attacked because she's a leader and an icon in the Palestine liberation movement. Um, and they, you know, they, they went after her uh, ostensibly for immigration violations, but really it was because she's a leading Palestinian and she was, um, an icon for for so many years in our in our liberation movement. Um, so I talked about that, and I talked about repression generally, and some of the repression that that we faced. People, um, you know, uh, in 2010 in Chicago and 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 Minnesota and Michigan and other places. Um, that Midwest 23 case, I was one of the people whose home was raided. 23 of us were subpoenaed to a federal grand jury. That was all around Palestine too. It was our work around Palestine that made us targets, That's right. Right? That's right? It was our it was work around Palestine that made some of those black liberation figures that Frank has talked about targets um, as well. And so, um, in that in that presentation to those students at UCLA, I said um, that I think we're winning. Um, I think you know it's it's difficult. I know how difficult it is to have buried forty thousand of your people. Mm. Um, and some of them you didn't have a chance to bury. And to still be able to say that we're winning. But I really, in my heart of hearts, believe that we are. Um, not only because of what I described earlier about the fact that the Israelis, even with the, 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 the largest, strongest military in the Middle East, cannot defeat the unified Palestinian resistance in Gaza, but because of what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Africa, in South America, in Europe, everywhere around the world, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions maybe of people standing up and, and saying Palestine must be free, stop aid to Israel, uh, implement an arms embargo, end the settler colonialist state. Right. Really, I've said it before on this show and I've said it publicly and USP, USPCN has been saying it for years, um, but it's starting to get some ammunition now. It's starting to get some, some traction, so to speak which is that South Africa, there was an international consensus at some point, at one point, finally, after many, many years of struggle by the Frank Chapmans of the world that said that, that South Africa did not have the right to exist as an apartheid, racist, settler colonialist state. And we're moving towards that international consensus on Israel in which very, very soon we're going to be saying that Israel does not have the right to exist That's right. as a Zionist, racist, settler colonialist, 
apartheid state. And so in front of those UCLA students, I said, this might not happen in my lifetime, but it will happen in yours because these are students who are all 18 to 22 years old, right? But now I've changed my line on that because I think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Yeah. And I believe that the last 11 months have moved us closer and closer to the exposing of Israel, the exposing of the U.S. imperialists, um, the, the potential and ultimate defeat of Israel, and the destruction of that racist Zionist state. That's the way that we will get our liberation, and that's the way we will you know, help liberate the rest of the Arab world as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, that, that's that's inspiring, um, and we're, we're we're coming towards the end of our our, our interview here, and I, I I appreciate those those final words especially, but I I'd, I'd like to ask each of you uh, about uh, what what are the next steps? You know, where are we? Uh, where do we go next from here? And what you know, our fight back radio listeners have shown uh, that they're, uh, they're 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 doers, and so uh, I want to thank our, our listeners. Um, what do we want them to do? What's our ask here? I'm going to let uh, uh, my comrade and friend Hatem take the lead on that. So I, I think um, I can talk about what USPCN is doing right now and what USPN, USPCN is saying, what the Palestine Liberation Movement in, in this country is saying. Um, I'd also love to hear, uh, you know, Frank talk about what the, you know, what the, the alliance um, is saying and, and what the alliance wants to uh, accomplish in the next period as well. My organization, the United States Palestinian Community Network, the movement in general for Palestinian rights here is is saying um, that you know we haven't heard anything from Kamala Harris that tells us that her policies on Palestine are going to be any different than Biden's. Um, and so we are making the same demands of Harris as we have made of Biden which is end U.S. aid, all U.S. aid to Israel, um, and implement an arms embargo against Israel. We cannot continue to send, as Frank mentioned, the billions of dollars of aid that we've sent in the last 11 months on top of the $5 billion that we send on an annual basis already um, and the and for them to buy the weapons or the weapons transfers directly, you did mention correctly that we don't send them normally weapons directly. We send them the money to buy the weapons from the U.S. corporations. But some of what we've seen in the last eleven months have been direct weapons transfers. Right now, yeah, boy, right. And so that has to end. That is the only way that the United States, which is the reason why Israel exists to begin with. Biden said it himself, right? He said it perfectly. He said, I am a, an imperialist by saying verbatim, if Israel did not exist, we would have had to manufacture it <laughs> because Israel is a manufactured state. It was manufactured by Great Britain in 1948. And then when the United States became the main imperialist power in the world and overtook Great Britain, it became the, the state that was supporting Israel as it does today. And so Harris must change her policy and the policy of her party and the policy of her government. Uh, that's the only way that Israel will stop the genocide. Um, and so when she... When people say that she's she's a she sounds a bit more sympathetic, she sounds a bit more empathetic. Um, While the bum is being dropped, yeah, none of that matters, right? None of that matters. The Palestinians are a very very proud people. We don't want bombs dropped on us on Monday, and then sugar and flour and rice dropped in our villages on Tuesday. When she says we need to let the humanitarian aid in. Who is we? Name it. It's Israel that's keeping it out. And it's Israel that's even keeping out aid that is coming from the United States. The gall 
of the country that exists only because the United States allows it to exist, saying mm. basically, you know, screw you, United States, we're not letting your aid in. And she still said we need to let it in. Right? right. That's exactly what we're talking about. Semantics, language is important because the policies are important. And so it doesn't matter that she sounds like she might be a little bit more empathetic because that doesn't mean anything if there isn't a change in policies. Correct. So that's what we're calling for clearly and unequivocally. And what the way to get it is to do what USPCN and the Alliance did way back in October, the second week of the genocide. When we recognized what was happening, what did we do? We shut down Jan Schakowsky's office. We shut down Sean Kasten's office. We shut down the street in front of Schakowsky's house. We shut down the street in front of Kasten's house. We shut down Lakeshore Drive, one of the main thoroughfares in Chicago, in front of Dick Durbin's house, the second most powerful Democrat in the entire Senate. That's what people need to do. We need to escalate. We need to disrupt. There's a black congresswoman in Chicago named Robin Kelly. We disrupted an event that had Chikowski at it or another congressperson at that time, Kasten maybe. And she got on the mic. She says, you know, my, my colleagues don't do events in Chicago anymore because they know that you all are going to be here disrupting them. That's what we need to do. No business as usual for all of these Democrats who are responsible for this genocide. They all are. Every single one of them who allow this policy are the ones who are responsible. And that's what we're, we're, we're going to continue to do to make them change that policy and, and stop this genocide. The people have to do it. If, if the Democrats and the government are not going to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Frank uh, you, Chapman, do you want to talk about uh, next steps? Well, just I would just want to say that we uh, support uh, uh, that program of action that Hatem just outlined. We support that 1,000%. And uh, we will uh, use every resource, every effort on the part of the Alliance to uh, uh, go into mobilizing uh, more people to stand with Palestine. We're going we're gonna to pick up the tempo. There are, many, there are many different areas that we're working in. We're going to be working on, on, on getting the referendum passed for community control of the police. You know, we're working on uh, getting those who have been wrongfully convicted out of, out of prison. Every time a police crime breaks out in a particular police district, you know, we're working on that. So uh, what we've been doing in the last period is that all those demonstrations that we've been having around those police stations, what, what all we've been doing, we've been doing it on, in conjunction with Pal Palestinians. And so we're going to bring the, uh, we're, we're going to raise the cry for justice for Palestine uh, uh, in, all of, in all of our work, you know. Uh, like we used to say uh, um, back in 2018, 2019, we used to say occupation is a crime from Chicago to Palestine. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna revive that. We're gonna pick up the tempo, uh, and, and and be right beside our, our, our Palestinian comrades, uh, in in the, in the program of action that uh, Hatem just outlined. Are you are you in the Black Liberation Movement neutral? No, we're not neutral. We're not Palestine? neutral. We're not neutral. We want Palestine to win. We're not neutral in this shit. All right. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, uh, Two giants of, uh, of our movement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank Chapman, uh, who's the executive director of the National Alliance of, Against Racist and Political Repression and a central committee member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and Hatem Abadea, who's uh, the national chair of the United States Palestinian Community Network. Thank you very much. Not exactly a giant like Frank, but thank you. <laughs> I don't know. You're growing pretty fast. <laughs> Okay, that was a, a powerful episode, I think. And uh, as we head into these elections, um, it's not a time for us to be sitting down on our hands. It's a time for us to get up, stand up, and fight back. And so whether you're a student on the campus, uh, it's important to join an organization. And uh, to whether there's encampments or picket lines or whatever, uh, you need to be a part of it. The, the boycott, uh, sanctions, and divestiture movement around Palestine, it's time for us to push forward. And, and the protests have been working. We saw this with Biden, where uh, when the uh, the war initially started stepping up, they weren't doing it. You know, he was he was just hard line. But as as his job got threatened, he started to move. 
And we see it again with Harris as uh, she was initially trying to scold the movement, but as, as the movement got stronger and stronger, she had to step back. And uh, so it's, it's time for us to, the protests are working, it's time for us to stand up and to be a part of them. So wherever you are, whether you're a student, whether you're in a labor union, you're in the community, um, it's, uh, it's time for us to stand up and, and, and make things happen here. Um, finally, I want to thank our, our guests, uh, Frank Chapman and Hatham Abadea, uh, for, for taking the time to be on this special show of uh, Fight Back Radio. Um, and as always, I want to thank our production team. Um, this time you can see we have uh, more cameras and, and video, and, and some of that is because of Fayani Aboma Mijana. And uh, also our regular production team people of Shane Tremley, Vince Olson, Dodd McColgan, and Natalie Pranis. And I'm Richard Berg for the entire Fight Back Radio team saying until next time, all power to the people.